There we go. So first and foremost, I want to make sure that everyone hears this. Um, even though I'm a medical doctor, this is my disclaimer saying that everything and anything you hear on this webinar, either from myself or another participant, is only to be taken as information. It's not medical advice from me to you, even if I am your actual medical doctor, and I see some of you out there for whom that applies to. Um, it is not medical advice in this moment. This is just general informational purposes. And any change or intervention you decide to do um, on your own as a result of what you learn here today should be taken um, on after a conversation with someone who you trust on your healing team. So here are the things that I really hope that you guys walk away with from this talk. Number one, I want you to be able to list seven things about Lyme that most doctors get wrong. These actually are the things that can make or break um, a Lyme healing project. So they're, they're important. And I, for those of you worried about having to make a list, you can take notes. I always recommend taking notes if that's the way you learn, but I'm also going to give you a helpful mnemonic to remember those things. I'd like you to be able to describe what successful Lyme doctors actually do um, and what makes them successful. I'd like you to be able to explain to a friend the importance of the terrain, and you'll get a definition for that term in a moment. And also to articulate five lifestyle domains that support Lyme recovery. These are things I find that if people aren't doing them, it just doesn't work. Finally, I'd like you to list three common obstacles, even though I'm going to give you five of them. I want you to remember at least three common obstacles to healing from Lyme, hopefully the ones that apply to you. And here's how we're going to achieve all that. So I'm going to start by telling you how I joined the Crazy Lyme Doctor Club, which was not a club I set out to join, I assure you. I'm going to um, walk you through Lyme 101, which is kind of what your doctor learned and what I learned in medical school and residency. And then I'm going to go into Lyme 201 and talk about what you need to know to be smarter than your doctor. We're going to go through my favorite tool for killing the bugs, because most people who show up to a Lyme talk really want to know what is the tool that I use. Um, and we'll get into what I do and don't use for that. We'll talk about the five steps that must be taken to heal. These are the lifestyle changes that I recommend five roadblocks to healing, and then a new opportunity um, for, to work with me for people who are still looking for a Lyme partner and haven't found one yet. So Lyme 101. First of all, every doctor knows that Lyme is a vector-borne infection. Um, we usually learn it as a tick-borne infection, and we also learn that there's a very specific tick that is the only tick that carries Lyme that happens to be wrong. Lyme is carried by almost every insect, and everything that bites you can transmit Bor Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. Doctors all learn that Lyme's prefer the heart and the joints and the nerves. Um, skin should also be on that list because doctors learn that the bullseye rash is a classic presentation for Lyme. It's also considered pathognomonic. That fancy doctor word means if you see this thing, think blank. And in this case, if you see a bullseye rash, think Lyme, because nothing else really causes that. It's not true that nothing else causes that. Um, allergic reactions to medications that are systemic can cause a bullseye rash as well. And reactivated Lyme can cause a bullseye rash, even though doctors don't really learn that Lyme can reactivate. Doctors also learn that 30,000 cases about you know, plus or minus are reported every year to the CDC. The CDC will readily admit that this misses about 90% of the actual Lyme that's in the US, um, but that number is still um, kind of what it gets reported. The reason it's so low is because, as we'll discuss, the testing is not very accurate and misses um, a great deal of actual Lyme. They also learned that Lyme is most common in the Northeast US and Europe. I remember a board's question during step one of my boards um, that said, you know, it had a, a case of a person who came into the ER and they had fever and their right knee was swollen and they had a bullseye rash and they had been traveling in Hawaii. And the question was basically, you know, is this blank, 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 blank. And the answer um, was no, it's not Lyme because they weren't in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania was always the state that was given as sort of the classic where you pick up Lyme. Um, and as we'll see, that's not necessarily always the case. We also learned that Lyme is treated with 28 days of antibiotics. Typically that antibiotic is doxycycline. 
Um, some doctors, if they're really savvy, will understand that um, neurological Lyme needs more than doxycycline, and they will often prescribe either IV ceftriaxone or intramuscular ceftriaxone or um, minocycline, which crosses the blood-brain barrier but is very similar to doxycycline. They hopefully also learn that one of the side effects of doxycycline in the summertime, which is a common time for people to get diagnosed with Lyme, it's not always the best time or only time they get a Lyme infection, but it's diagnosed more commonly in the summer, mostly because doctors believe it's a summertime illness. Um, but one of the things to watch out for when you're taking doxycycline and minocycline sometimes is a rash that can happen when you get in the sun. So a lot of people want to be out in the sun and going to the beach, and it's wonderful to be in nature. But if you are taking doxycycline, you have to be very careful about a very painful rash that can, can occur. It does resolve, but usually you need to go off the doxycycline for that to happen and, and treat the rash. And typically, we also learn that 10 to 20% of people develop a chronic form. These can be either people who came in with a hot swollen knee and got immediate treatment with Lyme for 20 or with doxycycline for 28 days and um, never really got better. Or once they got better on the antibiotics, but went off them, they got worse again. These can also be people who never got treated, maybe didn't notice a rash, maybe didn't have any kind of symptoms when they got infected, <clears throat> excuse me. But then five years later, when their immune system tanked for some other reason, maybe they were stressed out, maybe they, maybe COVID happened. Um, COVID actually is one of those things that I've seen stir up cases of old Lyme and latent Lyme, even Lyme that someone never knew they had, for example. Um, and so when people have Lyme sort of dormant and living in their tissues, and then it gets stirred up in some way, they also can develop a chronic form. And most of the people I see in my practice are not acute Lyme people. They're people who have had symptoms um, for years and years. All right, so now you know what your doctor knows. Are you ready for the rest of it? Yeah? Okay. Lyme 201, or, oops, let's see or things that will make you smarter than your doctor when it comes to Lyme disease. Number one, season is unimportant. I personally was bitten by a tick in November of 2011. Um, the temperature had been freezing that night because there was ice hanging from the trees, which caused the trees to kind of bend down and little ticks to kind of slide down like a fireman's pull on those icicles and land on my butt and bite me. Um, so it can happen, to, it can be transmitted at any time during the year. And people who say otherwise are just ignorant of the fact that ticks are active at below freezing temperatures. Oh, I missed one. So number two, Lyme may mimic any other disease. So this is similar, in fact, to Lyme's cousin, syphilis. Both syphilis and Lyme are caused by a spirochete organism, which means a little corkshoe shaped bacterium. In Lyme's case, it's Borrelia burgdorferi and other Borrelia species. In syphilis cases, it's Treponema pallidum. Um, Treponema pallidum actually has only 1 14th the genome or genetic material that, that Borrelia has. So um, presumably Borrelia is much more complex. And even though syphilis was always called the great imitator because it could create brain disease and insanity and schizophrenia, it could also create um, pain and you know obviously skin issues and symptoms of syphilis. It could create um, liver problems, it could create joint pain. Lyme is the same way. It can really go anywhere and do anything in the body. So Lyme also, Lyme is sort of the um, great imitator 2.0. Um, Lyme is something to consider always when other things have ruled out. So doctors are really, really good at ruling out terrible badness that can kill you today or tomorrow. Okay, so when you go to the doctor, and especially when you go to the emergency room, what's on the top of their minds is, okay, what's going on that could kill this person today or tomorrow on my watch? It's not going to happen. I want to make sure I rule out the heart attack, rule out the pulmonary embolus. So if you come in with Lyme disease that's manifesting in you as palpitations and shortness of breath, your doctor's going to be really good at making sure it's not your heart or your lungs that's causing that. They're not necessarily going to be really good at figuring out what is causing it once all the terrible badness has been ruled out. And unfortunately, Lyme falls into that category of things that takes a lot of digging and a lot of work and a lot of ruling out of other things before you get to a place where you're willing to say, this is Lyme disease for most doctors, okay? 
for me, it's always the top of my list because I people are coming to me having already been ruled out for all the terrible badness. And now I'm looking at what else could be going on. And often Lyme is there. So it's always to be considered when other things are ruling out. So the R in smarter than your doctor stands for rashes. Rashes are actually rare. So even though the bullseye rash is classic and pathognomonic for Lyme, that doesn't mean everybody who Lyme is going to, who has Lyme is going to have it. And in my experience, the people who get the sickest from Lyme and have the worst and most lingering and hardest to treat symptoms are the people who don't get the rashes. And here's why. The rash happens when your body sends immune cells to the site of a tick bite, right? You get a little puncture wound and you get a little opening there in your skin and your white blood cells rush to the site of the, of the crime and they start sampling what's there and they take back little bits of Borrelia burgdorferi in this case, little bits of spirochete to the spleen and to your lymph nodes. And they start having a conversation. Should we make some antibodies against this? Yes, yes, let's do it. So then the antibodies go to that site. And then in, more inflammation happens at that site, both from antibodies, but also from cytokines and things your immune system is doing to fight off what's coming in. And if it starts, if the tick bite is right in the middle of that bullseye, the ring around that bite gets larger and larger as the swelling, as the tick, uh, sorry, the bull, the Borrelia expands and the antibodies and also the cytokines and the other things the immune system are secreting to create inflammation there and try to stave it off, um, develop. And so the bullseye is actually a sign of a working immune system. 50% of people or fewer have an actual bullseye in response to being bitten by a tick. Now, as we will discuss, ticks aren't the only way. Bites aren't the only way to get Lyme. So that would also be a reason that people don't always have rashes with Lyme. So the T in smarter is that testing is truly, truly terrible. Most doctors diagnose Lyme if they even look for it by doing a blood test that looks at your immune system's ability to make antibodies against 15 or so of the subspecies of Borrelia that cause Lyme. We won't even talk about the other 85 or more that are out there, plus the ones we haven't discovered yet that could cause the same infection and illness, but have a different, slightly different makeup. Therefore, the antibodies that are made against them will be slightly different and not show up on a test that is looking for antibodies. Does that make sense? So let's say you get bitten by a tick and a little bit of Borrelia gets transmitted. And that little bit of Borrelia is one of the 15 species that the two-tiered testing, the ELISA plus Western blot were made to discover if Lyme is what's causing your problem, right? To diagnose Lyme. Well, so let's say you actually have a really strong immune system. Your immune system makes antibodies eventually. It doesn't happen immediately. It usually takes weeks for antibodies to be made. Six weeks is sort of the classic timeline. Um, but let's say you have the right bug bite. You have the right um, Borrelia injected into you with a tick bite and your immune system is strong and it's effective and it makes antibodies that show up on this test. Well, the test looks for only 10 different antibodies, um, long-term antibodies. They look for only three of the IgM or early phase, early reaction antibodies. If you don't have those specific ones, it's not going to show up as a positive test. To make things even crazier, the criteria for whether those, you know, for whether it's actually a positive test or not is that you have to have five out of the 10 IgG or long-term antibodies present for it to be called Lyme and symptoms for more than six weeks, because why would you have long-term antibodies if your symptoms or tick bite had been less than six weeks ago? Because it doesn't match the timeline. You also have to have for an acute infection before six weeks, two out of the three IgM antibodies. So if your immune system's not making those same antibodies or you've been infected with a different kind of Borrelia, nothing's gonna show up there to match those criteria. To make things even crazier, it's not only not specific, not sensitive as a test, as I've just described, but it's not even very specific as a test because five of those 10 antibodies in the IgG realm and two of the three in the IgM are not even specific to Borrelia burgdorferi, which means you could have some normal spirochete that's non-Borrelia and non-syphilis, hopefully, in your mouth, causing your body to have long-term immunity against it and make five antibodies against it that are not even related to Lyme. So for all these reasons, it's just not a test I rely on. It can be helpful 
at times. If you have a, a test that's positive for at least one of the species specific antibodies, um, P23 is probably the most common one I see on the Western blot. Those of you who've had a Western blot done will know what I'm talking about, but there are four others that are also very species specific. If you have at least one of those, that for me is information enough that you have experienced, you have been exposed to Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, luckily one of the 15 they made the test after and your body has encountered Lyme. Here's the next problem. Just because you've encountered Lyme doesn't mean whatever your current symptoms are, are Lyme disease, okay? And this is where the ruling out process becomes really important. I wanna make sure there aren't other things going on like gut dysbiosis or inflammation from a hidden food allergy or lack of sleep. I mean, all of these things can create chronic systemic inflammatory symptoms that can look a lot like Lyme disease. So you wanna rule out all that stuff by kind of hopefully by healing up those parts of your life and then see what symptoms are left. And if you still have Lyme, you know, a Lyme um, band on your Western blot at any point, that's enough to tell me, yeah, Lyme is probably what's going on here. So E stands for every biting insect is suspect. And that's not just biting insects, by the way. So they found Lyme in, they found the bug that causes Lyme in mosquitoes. They found it in sand fleas. They found it in um, regular fleas. They found it in every other tick. So lone star ticks, do any dog tick. I mean, anything that bites can carry Lyme. And if you don't um, appreciate that, you might miss the fact that someone has a tick bite or a, or a mosquito bite or a spider bite, and they have all the symptoms. But if you'd rule them out because it's the wrong bug, you're missing the point. It's also important to realize that Lyme spirochetes have been found in placentas of miscarried babies. Yeah, you heard that right. They've been found in semen. They've been found in breast milk. They've been found in the blood supply. So there are lots of ways, and I'll let your imagination take you into those various ways of, of how you could get Lyme disease. And a lot of kids are actually born with Lyme disease in their system. They're born with the spirochete rather in their system. Whether or not it develops into full-blown Lyme disease is usually a function of how healthy their terrain is. And we'll get there in a moment. And finally, the R in smarter than your doctor is that reports of Lyme have been made on every single continent. Lyme is such a political topic. And those of you who've been in this game for a while know that. Those of you who haven't are like, why? Why should it be political? It seems pretty straightforward. There's a lot that has to, that goes into this and it, too much to get into on this talk. And I don't even know all the reasons to be quite honest. Um, I believe it comes down to money. I believe it comes down to insurance companies not wanting to pay for years and years of you know, ceftriaxone or pick lines and IV antibiotics. Um, but be that as it may, people are still suffering as Lyme doctors and regular doctors and insurance companies and advocacy groups argue, people suffer. And so I want you to be empowered with this information so that if someone tells you this can't possibly be Lyme because of because it, you were bitten in September rather than May, or because you didn't have a bullseye rash, or because you don't have joint pain, or because you um, your test was negative, you can go back to them and say, actually, that's not accurate. And you can continue to look for a provider who can help you and, and tools that you can use either with or without a provider to, to get well. All right, so let's talk about the mismatch between people who are suffering and struggling. And in this case, doctors, I'm not gonna use the word providers because there are a lot of providers other than doctors who treat Lyme. Um, they don't call it treating Lyme because as a doctor, you're not allowed to diagnose and treat uh, medical ailments, but you are allowed to provide nutritional counseling and um, lifestyle management and herbs and acupuncture and other things. And so there are a lot of people out there treating Lyme who could help those who are struggling. And that's often what's needed given the mismatch. So let's start by just looking at ILADS. ILADS is the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. This is the group of people who I reached out to when I got Lyme. I was a new junior faculty in um, 2011, 20, 2010, 2011. I was seeing patients. I was working in the inner city. I was delivering babies frequently in the evenings and overnight. I wasn't getting a lot of sleep and I had a newborn. 
I had a one-year-old actually, he wasn't so newborn, but I was still somehow nursing him every hour throughout the night at age one. Um, and I was exhausted and I walked out to my, um, yard in the middle of the night to walk the dog. We had a puppy cause why not throw a puppy into that mix? And, um, as I said, there had been an ice storm in November and the the willow tree above my property was kind of dragging on the, on the ground and there were lots of icicles and I, I brushed by it. I, I brushed through it to get across um, to the island where I was going to take the dog. And um, I went back to bed and a, a few hours later, I was nursing my child because every hour I was nursing my child and I felt a strange tingling and strange sensation on my rump. And I reached down and I kind of scratched and I pulled off a black legged nymph deer tick. And I was like, Oh, mm, that's not good. And I threw it away. You know, I went and flushed it down the toilet, which you're not supposed to do because presumably they can bounce around and, you know, not go down the toilet. But this one did, I watched it go in a piece of toilet paper. And I went back to bed and two days later I had a bullseye rash and I had symptoms of inflammation and joint pain and zinging, zinging feeling in my face. And, um, that was the beginning of my what I like to call my near-death experience with Lyme disease, which lasted about two years. The worst of it being the first several months when I was treating myself with doxycycline, which at that time was the only thing I knew how to do. So I hadn't been trained as a Lyme doctor yet. I hadn't really experienced all of these things. You guys are now smarter than I was around Lyme at that time. And uh, luckily I had had a patient recently, probably a month earlier, who had come to me with palpitations and shortness of breath and sweats and inability to hold urine, um, which was super inconvenient for her um, because she was an artist model and she couldn't do her job without leaking all over. And so she hadn't been able to work. She had terrible foot pain, just like unbearable um, sens sensory issues in her feet, couldn't wear regular shoes, had to wear flip-flops even in the winter. Her feet were burning all the time. She had symptoms now I know of Babesia and Bartonella and Lyme. Um, and probably mold and other things. Um, but at the time I, I was just like, oh my gosh, this poor, lovely woman whose life has been completely derailed by a walk in the woods and a fever. And now this a year later. And she said to me after that visit, you know, I believe I have Lyme and Babesia and Bartonella. And if you're going to be my doctor, you have to read this first. And she like handed me the stack of printouts from her research. And I said to myself, yes, I am definitely going to do that for her and for me, because I don't know what the heck's going on here. And in reading that, I learned about all the things you guys are going to learn on this talk today. And I realized that, wow, we are, I, we as doctors are missing Lyme all over the place. And I have missed it in countless patients. And I don't want to miss it in her and honestly, I kind of feel a little bit sick too, and I don't really want to miss it in me. Well, it took me getting a tick bite to really get in the ring with it. And long story short, I um, recovered myself from that. It took a couple of years and it took a lot of learning and it took, um, it took a whole overhaul of my lifestyle and commitment to eating in a certain way and sleeping and making sure I, I took care of those foundational pieces. Um, but during that time, the ILADS community was hugely helpful. And actually that patient had connected me with ILADS. She said, this is where, you know, this is where the Lyme doctors learn. And I got on their website and I learned, wow, there's a whole other group of doctors and advocates and researchers and patients and scientists who think about Lyme in a really different way, who are really coming at it from the Lyme 201 as opposed to the Lyme 101 approach. And I just delved into that research. I read everything I could. It was all very doctor friendly. Like it was all very scientific and evidence-based and, you know, pulled, you know, the, it turns out there's all sorts of evidence in the literature, you know, which is what doctors always want to see. Well, is it in the literature? Is there a randomized controlled trial? Has it been published by someone who I approve of in English, preferably and in the United States? Well, yeah, there's a lot of stuff from around the world, but there's a lot of stuff in the States too. And it's stuff that I'd never been pointed to. It's not, no one had ever discussed it. There was just sort of a dogma around the Lyme 101 approach. And so I learned a lot from the ILADS. I trained with them. I did their um, Turn the Corner Foundation has a grant that they 
uh, allow doctors to come and shadow Lyme savvy or Lyme literate doctors. And I shadowed Ann Corson, who at that time was working in um, outside of Kennett Square and um, spent a total of a week with her over several months. I was too sick at the time to go for a whole week. I was still lying down in between patients, but I was ravenous for this information and just really, really needed to, knew I needed to take my game to the next level once I was well. And so as I was recovering, I was learning from them. So yesterday I did a search on ILADS. ILADS, um, I'm, a, I'm a member of ILADS now, but you can do, even as a non-member, a search for providers, or you can reach out to them and say, this is my area code. I'm looking for a Lyme literate or a Lyme trained, trained by you doctor, and they will send you a list. Turns out I, and I didn't know this until yesterday, I'm the only one in my area code, my zip code rather. And um, there, were only, there were only 84 in the US, which I kind of couldn't believe. So it turns out that if you take those 84 physicians and you try to match them up with the 30,000 new reported cases of Lyme every year that get reported to the CDC, you get 357 new patients per ILADS provider per year. I have fewer than 357 patients in my practice total. Now I'm a solo practitioner. I don't have a bunch of, you know, physician extenders as they call them. I don't have PAs working for me, nurses. That's just me. And I couldn't certainly do my part. It also turns out if you take the actual number that the CDC thinks are out there every year, which is about 478,000, that number becomes almost 6,000 patients per provider per year, huge mismatch, okay? There's a huge access problem, which wasn't new to me, but the scope of it was new. So this is why I think it's really important for anyone who has Lyme to figure out how to make do with what you have and look for traits in your doctor that could make them a good Lyme doctor. And so the next little bit here, I'm gonna be sharing what those traits are because often when people call me, and I talk to them about who's on your healing team already, they'll describe a really lovely primary care physician, family practice or internist or their child's pediatrician who's clearly eager to learn about Lyme, eager to go beyond the Lyme 101 approach that they learned and we all learned in med school and understand what this disease truly looks like and how to truly manage it. And so I'm gonna encourage you as we talk about this for the next few minutes to think about who's on your healing team who could be your Lyme doctor or your Lyme healer who isn't already. I'm gonna share some characteristics that I think make them good ones. Number one, they should be a good listener. And sometimes that means taking out the computer and just sitting down with you face to face. So a good litmus test is if you've been to the doctor recently and they haven't made eye contact with you once or touched you, probably it's time to look for a different doctor. I used to say, why don't you give them feedback? <laughs> I think that was naive. I don't think doctors are, I think doctors take getting burned out for the most part these days to really revamp what they're doing because trust me, you may find it completely lacking in human contact and meaning to go see your doctor these days. They feel the same way. They don't like sitting in front of a desk all day and sitting on a computer and clicking off boxes that they have to do for insurance. I mean, this is one of the reasons I don't take insurance. I don't want to have to be beholden to my notes and to them. I'd rather be beholden to my, my person in front of me. It's also really important to find someone who's open to the long game, okay? The idea that Lyme is kind of easy to catch and easy to cure, which has always been the CDC's kind of tagline about it, and that 28 days of doxy will be like mischief managed is a problem because it's just not accurate for most people. And even if it is, those people still need to be informed about the fact that Lyme is going to be forever living in their system. Doxycycline doesn't eradicate Lyme. If anything, doxy does a really good job at causing it to roll up into these little cysts and hang out deep in your joints and in your scar tissue and in kind of immunologically privileged sites, we call it basically places the immune system doesn't get easily and just hang out. And so what that means is when the coast becomes clear, when your immune system dips for any reason, lack of sleep, stress on your job or in your marriage, stress about finances, COVID infection, fear of COVID infection, poor diet, mold in your HVAC system. I mean, for any reason, 
Lyme can come out and emerge again. So people need to understand that it both needs to be treated until people are better. And then people need to be empowered to understand they have a risk forever and they have to be on top of their immune system. That's the long game. I like to say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Speaking of marathons, I had to share this. So this April, my son ran his first marathon and this is his girlfriend. She ran her third marathon, second Boston marathon. Um, he'd only run, I think, 13 miles in a row before, which was kind of amazing. Happily, they both survived and crossed the finish line. You can see he looks a little bit less um, kind of alive here at mile 17. The bottom line is marathons um, can be run even by people who've never run more than 13 miles before. I was astounded at how many people were running marathons and not even running. People were walking the Boston Marathon. People were being pushed in the Boston Marathon. People were being dragged behind in trailers. You know, I saw dads carrying hurt kids in their in little pull behinds. It was beautiful. And I saw blind people who were attached to other people who were not blind, who were guiding them through the whole 26.2 miles. It was powerful. So I'm here to tell you that pretty much anyone can run a marathon and Lyme is a marathon. And on those, on those days you feel like you can't do it, just know that you can slow down. You can grab a buddy. You can ask someone to pull you for a little bit. You can take a, you can stop and take a drink and take a rest and you can still get to the finish line. And having a doctor who understands this and the long game means you have a doctor who you can sometimes lean on when you're feeling blind, or sometimes you'll probably be leading them because they'll be a little blind too. It's good to have a doctor who's a humble learner. This means they're open to reading and learning new things. This is just some of the books on my shelf that I snapped last night. And these are all things that I delved into as I was trying to reconceptualize what it means to take on this very complex organism and the illness it causes, because it's not just about killing the bugs. It's about really healing the whole person so that they can come back and do the work of healing themselves. So for humble learners who are looking for a good reading list, I really recommend both my ebook, which I wrote as a DIY holistic healing manual for anybody who's trying to learn about Lyme, including doctors who want to treat their patients with my approaches. And I also recommend the ILADS website. One of the things on that website that I found really useful as I was learning about Lyme initially, and that I passed on to many, many doctors as a little 16 or 13, 18 page stack of a reading stack is the advanced topics in Lyme disease, which can be found on the ILADS website. I made these little QR codes for those of you who don't know what they are. You just take your phone, you open up the, the camera, and then you aim the camera right at those little black um, boxes. And each of them will pull up a different website that when you touch on it, it'll take your phone to those websites. And if you want to make, want to take a screenshot of this and do that later, you can. I will encourage you not to necessarily buy my ebook in this moment, because at the end of the talk, when I talk about how to work with me, I'm going to share an opportunity um, that comes along with a free ebook. So don't jump the gun there. All right. Continuing along with what to look for in a Lyme doctor or how to build your perfect Lyme doctor out of the doctor you have, you want someone who has flexible access and who can actually see you, right? Um, we did a really interesting experiment last week, Jerry and I, um, and when I say Jerry and I, I really mean Jerry, she did most of the work. She called around um, probably 30 different local doctors who either showed up on the ILADS website or on the palime.org website as Lyme literate doctors. Um, one interesting fact was that a good handful of them, Jerry can tell us how many at the end, but I think probably five or six of the people she called said, I'm not a Lyme doctor. How did I get on this list? <laughs> Which is an interesting thing. Um, I was on that list, even though I haven't taken patients for new year for two years. And, um, a lot of them, a lot of the doctors, I don't think anyone could get in same day or same week. It was usually a four to six wait, if not longer. There are some doctors who are booking out for 10 months, meaning you can't see them until, you know, 2024. So you want someone who actually has access and availability. Now, and once you get in, you want someone who you can access in an ongoing way. If you can only see them once every six months, they're not going to be there to help you tweak your protocol, help you learn what's working, because Lyme is really about doing little experiments, seeing what's changing, seeing how you're evolving. Um, I call this the complexity game that I talk about in my ebook and teach in my ebook and courses, but basically you want someone who's gonna help you on the sidelines as you're kind of engaging these different experiments trying to recover. Bonus points, if this 
doctor understands that it's less about the bug and more about the terrain. I mean, this is the hardest one I think for doctors to, to grasp because we've all been trained that if there's an infectious disease, the bug is what you go after. You know, even though, and this has always fascinated me since medical school, it's never been more in stark contrast, stark relief than with the COVID epidemic. You know, not everyone who gets COVID gets sick, right? Because it's not about the bug. It's about the person who gets the bug. It's about their terrain. It's about how healthy their detoxification pathway is, how stagnant or congested or not their liver is, how healthy their gut terrain is, how, how their immune system is functioning. All these things play into whether a person can easily manage a Lyme infection. And there are people who get bit by a tick or sexually transmitted Borrelia or some other way who don't get sick. They just don't get sick. Sneezing, not sneezing. And so it's important to study those people and say, well, what's going on with them? Oh, you didn't die from COVID? Well, it turns out you didn't have the major risk factors for dying from COVID, right? Those are all terrain issues. And luckily, all of them except for age are, are modifiable. So lifestyle also matters, and doctors need to understand this. This is what determines your terrain, okay? Um, actually, I think I missed a slide. Yeah, I, I wanted to say one other thing about the terrain here, which is that there's this 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 dichotomy or this kind of this tension between is it the terrain or is it the germ has been going on for centuries. Um, Louis Pasteur was well known for this argument he had with Duchamp that, that was basically like, you know, Pasteur was like, no, it's all about the bug. You have to pasteurize the milk. You have to get rid of the germ. Um, in, in our modern society, we might say, well, we have to vaccinate the fish in this dirty tank and keep it in a plastic bag, as opposed to, we'll just clean the tank, right? We'll just take care of the terrain. Duchamp would always say, no, say, say the terrain. it's the terrain. And um, there's an apocryphal story of, of Louis Pasteur on his deathbed saying, oh, never mind, Deschamp, Duchamp was right, it is the terrain. So I don't know if that actually happened, but I do know that there is this tension even today in terms of how people want to think about infections. Here's what I would say to you. If, you know, and the COVID thing is just easy to refer to because everybody's aware of it now, right? Lyme is a little bit more esoteric, but um, if you're, if you're not asking the question of what are the people who didn't die doing right, I think we're missing a huge opportunity. And it's not to blame people who died, right? It's, but it's to say, wow, what can we do to change how our body responds to something that comes in from the outside? Because let's face it, we are our microbiome. We are always picking up germs and we're picking up viruses. We're picking up bacteria and parasites. If we don't have a way to, way to manage that and a way to influence how we manage it, all bets are off. So these are the people on the cover of my ebook. I don't know them. Someone said to me recently, I like the picture of you and your daughter on your husband on the ebook. That's not me. Um, I paid for that picture. But I will say I like the picture because it tells us that there is a possibility of vibrancy and aliveness and running in the field with your kid flying a kite and smiling and being in nature and running on the grass and not being afraid. All these things go into lifestyle. So lifestyle basically boils down to the basics, right? Eat healthy. That's usually organic. That's usually non-inflammatory. Non move healthy. All right, health illy. But move every day, find a way to move your body. Our bodies were not designed to sit in front of computers and to sit on sit in cars all day. We're designed to move and run and be joyful. Sleep healthy, right? Make sure you get your eight hours or more of sleep. And I say, or more, because eight hours is just a ballpark, right? It's just like saying, drink eight, eight six ounce glasses of water, eight, eight ounce glasses of water. Like it kind of depends on the person. So in terms of water, you should be drinking half your body weight in ounces of water. So I'm 160. That means 80 ounces for me, which means I'm a little behind. I'm going to take a drink. This is an opportunity for you to drink too. So sleep turns out to matter. And if you're waking up with an alarm clock, you're not getting the sleep you need, period. When I had Lyme, I was sleeping 12 hours a night. That means I would go to bed at seven so I could wake up at seven so I could go to work because I was still working for three of those near-death experience early months. Um, so if you're not getting the sleep you need, you're not getting, you're sleep deprived by definition. 
<clears throat> and I really encourage people to rethink their approach and their relationship to sleep because it truly matters. You need to poop healthy. If you're not pooping, you're not getting rid of toxins, period. I mean, you're peeing a little bit out, you're sweating out, you're breathing out, you know, some grows out in your hair and nails, but your gut is designed to remove 80% of your toxins. And much of what people experience when they're, they have joint pains from Lyme, or they have brain fog from Lyme, or they have neurological symptoms from Lyme, or they have gut issues from Lyme. Those symptoms are the result of inflammation, which creates chemicals in your body, which need to be taken out. Like that's trash, right? And the more you can take out the trash, the better. So you got to be pooping every day, at least once a day. And you have to believe healthy. You have to have a mindset that says, I can recover. Even if right now it's hard for me to see how, I believe that my body has the capacity to heal. And I believe that my team is out there, even if I haven't identified them yet. And I believe that I can recover my own inner rock star, even if I've never actually felt like a rock star. I saw someone last week who said, I, I always ask people, when was the last time you felt like your best version of yourself, like your total 100% rock star you? And she said, I don't think I've ever, I've ever felt good. Okay. That doesn't mean you don't have an inner rock star. Okay. And you got to believe that it's possible because your cells are taking their marching orders from your thoughts. So the big, the third big bonus point comes if you can understand that there are obstacles. And this is where a lot of doctors who kind of lean into the um, naturopathic thing and lean into the detox and lean into the diet, which is all great and all really important, miss this next piece because some people will get better when you heal their gut with an elimination diet, for example, or you put them on the anti-inflammatory autoimmune paleo, whatever, they will get better because their gut heals their immune system comes back to life and their immune system just manages the bugs. That's pretty awesome, right? And some people will need more. I wrote my ebook in a layered fashion. So people can layer on, start with the basics and then layer on what you need after that. But at the end of the day, some people don't get better even with all of that. And so it's important that you understand what are the common pitfalls and how do you get people out of them? So a good doctor understands that biofilm is real. Biofilm is the slime created by bacteria and other pathogens. Parasites create a lot of it too. Um, malaria and Babesia. These are all um, different organisms that when they live in a terrain, they need to stay in community. They're like us. They need a healing team. They need a community, a social and, and nutritional and protective environment. And to get that, they secrete biofilm. They, they conspire with the resources in your body to construct these little films throughout your body, throughout your blood vessels, throughout your muscles, throughout your fascia, throughout your interstitial space, throughout the gut and hollow organs like the bladder. In fact, chronic, sinus, chronic sinusitis or chronic sinus infection is a biofilm issue. It's not that you keep getting the same bug that keeps infecting you. No, your terrain has now meshed with the bug in a biofilm and you've got it lining the sinuses in your nose. And so your body, your immune system, when it tries to fight those bugs, can't actually get to them because biofilm is there. Another issue that comes along with biofilm is clotting. A lot of my patients have um, genetic clotting disorders that are undiagnosed. And so one of the things I always look for now, having learned this a few years ago from my friend, Ruth Kriz, um, who's an expert in this in this arena, is that if you're not looking for those clotting disorders and then treating them, you're not able to break down that biofilm and allow people's immune system and whatever else you might be using to assist in the killing of bugs to actually get to the bugs. Second big one is mold. Um, mold should have probably been number one, just because I want people to remember it is just so important. And so many people have mold in their houses, in their in their cars, <laughs> in their workplaces, in their schools, and um, in their bodies. 24% um, of the population, it turns out, cannot genetically cannot take a second step in the pathway that removes mold from the body. So a toxin comes in, we breathe it in again, we're always soaking in these things. And they create an immune response, which is initial and innate and mostly cytokine storm to kind of create a little fire to invoke more of a response and bring more immune cells to the battle. But then the second part, where they tag that mold with an antibody or some other tag to remove it from the body doesn't happen. They genetically can't do that second step. 
And so these people tend to get filled up with mold. They can get colonized in their sinuses and their bladder and their gut and their skin. They can also just have cytokine storm all over because the mold toxins never leave. There are ways to get them out. I teach that in my book and also in my courses, but it's crucial that you understand this issue because I do not see people getting well unless they get out of the mold and unless they deal with ongoing exposure. Heavy metals are another big issue. These things are ubiquitous. Right now, aluminum is kind of the top dog. Um, there's also, of course, always mercury. And these things can really undermine a healthy immune response so that it can't do its job. Heavy metals also can poison your detoxification pathways in the liver by sitting on enzymes that um, healthier and more natural and less toxic, I guess, metals would sit on, such as uh, magnesium and zinc, displacing those things so that you lose and waste those other good minerals and then your enzyme is poisoned and it can't do the work of detoxing from all the inflammation that comes along with these infections. Hidden food allergies is huge. This is probably the first step I take with most patients is helping them to do an elimination diet so that they can learn for themselves what foods are supportive of their recovery. In other words, what foods don't cause symptoms and cause worsening and what foods to leave out for best results. For people who don't wanna do an elimination diet, I think it's still a really good idea to get out gluten, dairy, sugar, caffeine, and alcohol um, when you're in the midst of a Lyme healing project. And finally, parasites. I say this till last because it's the one that makes people wanna run screaming from the building the most, but the bottom line is we are collectors. You know, We are universes of organisms. Lyme is there often and um, COVID is now there for most of us, just living in the living in the microbiome. Parasites are also there. And similar to the rats that will come to your house if you leave out large bags of garbage, parasites will come in larger numbers if your house, if your terrain is filled with toxins and mold and heavy metals and other, and you know, glyphosate, different chemicals. The more toxic your terrain is, the more parasites will come to almost buffer that from you. So pr protect you really. Um, they can also house Lyme, you know? So if you're not taking, if you're not aware of this, you're not gonna take care of this. And I want you to be aware. So I'm gonna go off on a little tangent right now. I've told you about what I think is important in a good Lyme doctor. And you'll mention, you'll notice I didn't mention, you know, they have to give you antibiotics. I don't believe antibiotics are the only way to kill bugs. And I'm gonna walk through the three main ways that I use to kill them. So I use herbs. First and foremost, there are two companies that I really love. Both of these were um, started by people who'd been touched by Lyme. The first is Beyond Balance. Susan McCamish was a mother and a master herbalist when her son became ill with Lyme and co-infections, uh, Babesia and Bartonella in particular, and um, became wheelchair bound. And he was a young, healthy guy and suddenly couldn't move, couldn't walk. And she did all the normal, went to the doctors, got the Lyme 101 spiel. Maybe they even got Doxy for 28 days. I don't know. But what I do know is what they did didn't help him. And ultimately she came away going, what am I going to do to heal my kid? And she um, said, well, you know, I know what his symptoms are. I know what, what he's been diagnosed with in terms of bacteria and viruses and these different things. And I know what herbs will work on those things. So I'm going to make him some, some extracts. And so she created extracts for him out of the herbs that she knew would work for his symptoms. And he got well. And out of that, she started a company called Beyond Balance. Her herbs are all um, delicious. She, they're extracts put into glycerin as opposed to alcohol. So they don't challenge people who have toxic livers already. And they are um, very powerful and very effective. And so I often rely on those. There's a, a newer company, newer to me anyway, called Vital Plan. I've learned about this in the last year. Dr. Bill Rawls is a, it was a, was an OBGYN practicing OBGYN when he came down with a really severe case of Lyme disease, um, probably also Babesia just based on his symptoms, although I don't know he was ever tested for that and ultimately recovered his health, not through Western medicine, tried, didn't work similar to me, didn't work that way and had to look outside the box. What he found was Stephen Buhner's protocol. Stephen Buhner was a master herbalist who sadly died a few months ago from pulmonary complications from a longstanding um, lung issue, but just a beautiful man. Really, I heard him speak uh, at a conference once and just was almost moved to tears by how much he seemed to embody um, plants and an understanding of plants. 
And it was empowering to, um, to learn from him in that way. He wrote several books. One of them is um, Healing Lime, which is obviously a great place to start if you're looking into learn more about these herbs. But importantly, they weren't hard. They weren't easy for me when I was learning about Stephen Buhner, when I had Lyme, I, I couldn't, my brain was so foggy that I couldn't figure out how to put all these herbs together in an organized and coherent way. I couldn't figure out how to take them. Um, and so what I love about vital plan is that Dr. Bill Rawls, who also got well, who got well from the Buhner protocol has been able to take those in the right proportions and put them in capsules so that you get, you get just like four bottles and you take, you know, three twice a day. And it gives you everything that's not only everything on the protocol that Buner uses, but also um, everything to support your mitochondria. So it's kind of an easier uh, way to do it, to do a self, a DIY recovery with herbs. And and the, the kit he uses, or the kit I would use for that would be the restore kit because it's comprehensive and it also helps restore your mitochondria and your immune system. So the second thing I love uh, to use when I kill bugs is oxidation. Oxidation is actually something that your own cells do to kill foreign invaders. Your, your you know, neutrophils and your mast cells and your, your different um, kind of your, your natural killer cells can sidle up on an organism like a spirochete, for example, and kind of get around it, engulf it, and then create this little package of oxidative materials. Oxidation means that a molecule can rip electrons off another molecule. And hydrogen peroxide is one of the things that you may have in your cupboard already that you may pour on a wound when it gets, um, when you have an open wound to kill the bugs and it bubbles, but you wouldn't drink it because it might be too powerful for your cells. Well, your cells actually make hydrogen uh, peroxide, H2O2, and dump it in a very localized and intense way on invading, um, invading bugs to kill them. So oxidation is something your cells know how to do. In... Uh, 2015, I learned about another method of oxidation. I learned about chlorine dioxide. This is something that had been used by um, many people around the world for a variety of things, including a lot of municipal water supplies. It's used to kill the bacteria and the parasites that live in water, but it's safe for humans to drink because it's not strong enough as an, oxidize, as an oxidizing molecule to rip the electrons off of healthy human tissue. And so chlorine dioxide is very effective for killing bugs and not harming, not harming healthy humans. Um, I learned about it at a Lyme conference, actually at a Klingheart conference, um, as a as sort of an anecdotal story about a woman in Mexico named Carrie Rivera, who was using this to kill bugs and, um, and to heal autism, actually, in the process. So uh, that got my attention. You know, anybody puts those two words together, heal and autism, and you're like, okay, well, either they're going to get burned at the stake or they're going to win a Nobel Prize. And I'm always curious about which it's going to be. So I sort of delved into learning about her and read everything I could about it and pulled up all the studies I could about it. There actually have been a lot of studies, uh, especially in the dental literature, using chlorine dioxide because it's a very effective antimicrobial and it doesn't kill human tissues. And so dentists use it to kind of power through all those little tiny devices that they put in your mouth and the next guy's mouth and it just kills everything. It's it's an antiseptic. Um, it's used to clean slaughterhouse floors. It's also used to, uh, as I said, clean the water supply in many countries and in many municipal water supplies. And so to me, it seemed like, wow, it makes a lot of sense. It seems from these studies that it's actually safe to ingest. She had been giving it to kids on the spectrum for about three years when I learned about her and she'd recovered 82 kids at that point from autism. Um, so whether you believe that or not, I, I'll tell you, I was interested and curious and a little skeptical, but the more I learned, the more convinced I was that this was safe to drink and also, um, potentially very helpful. So, um, a, a few months after I learned about it, I, uh, had another tick bite. I was out gardening and someone had given me some, some berry bushes and I was putting them in my garden. And I felt, I felt suddenly the same jaw, like zingy, zingy jaw pain and a little bit of pain in my toe and a little bit of pain in my wrist. And I was like, whoa, this is suddenly after, you know, two years of not feeling any Lyme symptoms. These are like all coming back in like 10 minutes. I probably have another tick bite because one thing that can happen when you get a new tick bite is that either you can get a new influx of Borrelia or whatever else the tick is carrying, Babesia, Bartonella, whatever, um, or 
and, and, or, and you can get uh, a reactivation of the latent and dormant kind of sleeping bugs in your body. And in fact, that's what happened to me. And I assume that's what happened to me because I didn't get any new symptoms anywhere else. I didn't get a rash there, but I did get everything kind of reactivated. The reason for this is that the tick is secreting in its saliva um, chemicals that are tropic or kind of like a magnet for dormant spirochetes. And this is probably an evolutionary thing that allows um, infections to kind of move from host to host, right? If you, you sense that little thing and you're, you sense that new chemical and you sort of sniff it out and the bacteria can swim to it very quickly, reinfect that tick. And then that tick will take um, them to a new host. So the bottom line is I got Lyme a third time um, at this point. I skipped over my first Lyme. It was boring. I was one of those people who was like, ah, mischief managed, no big deal. 28 days of doxy the first time. Um, the third time was, um, a little scary because I was like, oh, really universe? Like, haven't I already done this? <laughs> like, how I changed my whole life, changed my whole practice, learned all these tools? Yes. And it's time to learn a new tool because I had just learned about chlorine dioxide. I decided to use this for my third round of Lyme. And it was hands down the cheapest, the, the easiest, and the kind of seamless and least complicated of all the things I knew. And so um, a lot of people who come to see me want to use this way to kill their bugs. And finally, antibiotics. Um, antibiotics have a role to play. And sometimes that's because a person says, the only thing that will get me well is antibiotics. Oh. And if someone says that, then I want to honor their belief and do what they think will help them. Mm -hmm. um, certainly antibiotics can help people get well. I've seen it happen. I will tell you that it doesn't seem to me to be the most uh, sustainable course. If people aren't going to do the other things, they're not going to achieve like a sustained and full and lasting recovery, but certainly antibiotics can be used. And there are a variety of ones and getting into the details of those is beyond the scope of this talk. So finally, this is in summary, you want a doctor who's going to listen to you and not just look at their computer. You want a doctor who's going to read and learn and be willing to bring, to read what you bring them that you're learning. You want someone who's accessible. You want someone who understands that lifestyle really matters and how to educate you about that. If you walk in and your doctor has a really crappy lifestyle and you can see that in everything about them, I would get a new doctor, honestly, you know, and maybe give them a pamphlet on lifestyle measures. You want to make sure your doctor understands the common obstacles and what to do about them. You want to make sure they understand that it's not just about vaccinating the fish for a dirty tank. Like you sometimes got to clean the tank and then the fish is actually pretty healthy. And then you want to realize that this is a marathon and not a sprint. And that with this comprehensive plan and patience and a partnership with this practitioner, you can get to the finish line, even if you've never run more than 13 miles. All right. So this is my answer to the open issue, because when I look back at this picture, I'm like, yep, 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 yep. Oops. I don't have a lot of access right now. And this is something that's been plaguing me. And I've been back and forth about what to do about this for many, many months. And this is what I've come up with guys. So I'm going to share with you the new way to work with me. It's not that I'm opening my door to new patients, but what I am doing is I've created a, a coaching program for people who want to work with me as a coach to better understand what Lyme is to have access to my Lyme doctor brain and everything in it, including the stuff that I haven't learned yet that I'm learning you know, today and tomorrow, to develop insights into why their protocols might not be working. Like, let me help you identify the stumbling blocks. Let me sort of be another brain looking at the whole picture and thinking about, okay, what haven't we looked at? What stone is not yet um, turned, turned over to show us what could be beneath it? It's a place for people to ask questions and get answers from a doctor who has been there and who has access to all of these resources. And finally, it's a, it's a confidence builder. It's something that's going to make you feel more empowered, both in terms of conversations with your own doctor or practitioners and family, you know, who might not understand what's going on. Um, and to really stoke that belief in yourself that you can recover from Lyme. You know, I was 30 pounds down. I was not, I was not able to get out of bed. I couldn't walk without pain. I couldn't stand without pain for months and months and months. I didn't, you know, some days I didn't think I could live. I really thought I was dying for a good deal of that near-death experience. And I fully recovered. Like I, and it didn't happen overnight. Like again, marathon, not a sprint, but like, 
And there were times when I was absolutely like asking people to carry me in a wagon um, across that, you know, on mile 17. And it, it was hard and it took a long time and it took everything in me. And it was a gift at the end of the day. It was a gift because everything I am now stems from what I had to become in order to overcome Lyme disease. And I believe that's possible for you too. So the way we um, run this is there's weekly Zoom calls with me. So you get a, you're in a group, we're all in Zoom together. The first half hour of the call is a case review. So when you sign up for this program, you get invited to pick a date to do your case review. You bring your labs, you bring your studies, you bring your story, um, you bring your questions. And we spend 30 minutes with me listening and trying to understand what's missing and what's what you're, what you're doing right and where to make sure we focus attention moving forward. And then coaching you around that. The second half of that hour is questions from the group, thoughts and ideas from the group who may have other ideas to throw into the mix um, and follow-ups from people who've had past case reviews. You get access as part of this program to my online Lyme library, um, which is at this moment, not on the membership site yet, because I don't know who's going to be in the group. I don't know what you guys are going to need. I don't want to overwhelm already overwhelmed Limeys, right? Lyme brain can, can feel very overwhelming just to, you know, get out of bed in the morning and make breakfast. So I want people to get things as needed. And I will be sharing things based on what comes up in our conversations. You get a supportive community of recovery oriented Limeys. And I will tell you that even the most recovery oriented, positive thinking glasses, always half full limey has bad days. And one of the purposes of this coaching program is to provide some accountability for your mindset so that you don't get stuck in a spiral of this is going to take me down. I can never get well, which can be really common. So that's part of why I wanted to do this in a group. And part of why I think it's so important to have something like that on your healing team, even if it's not this group. You get 15% off all my offerings. That includes my other memberships. That includes my courses, my elimination diet course that I do every year and is now available, um, I think, 24-7. You can get it anytime, but you get a discount on that. You also get a free copy of my ebook if you don't have one yet. So this is a place where you can um, learn more about that program and sign up. I hope to see some of you or maybe all of you on our next call and um, if you have questions, please reach out to me. I'm at support at Kristen Ryman, MD. Jerry can throw that in the chat real quick. Um, and if you have further questions about the membership that we didn't answer today, please reach out and let us know so we can help you guys get clear on whatever decision is, is in alignment with your highest good. All right. Have a beautiful rest of your day and a happy summer and tick season, which is year round. And I will see you when I see you. Be well, everyone.